everybody, welcome to the Nightcast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Tyler. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> Steve. And I'm Josh, because, you know, I actually remembered the order that we were saying hi to everybody. I, I reminded him three times. <laughs> and it wasn't even that I remembered him like a half an hour ago. It was like literally right before I started. <laughs> it was so well. bad. <laughs> we, love this... you. we love you, Tyler. We love you, Tyler. You uh, know look, that. I was processing what was someone said in chat, okay? A serial killer said in chat, I bet that's not the first time Tyler has said I went way early. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of distracted me. So sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the Linux cast. We talk about Linuxy things. Also, the chat distracts us half the time. That's the way it works. If you want to watch live, we record this live every Saturday around 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Although we're about a half an hour later than I wanted to go, but that's okay. That's just because we, we, we chatted for a good half an hour before we started recording. Uh, if you want to watch the pre show after the live stream, uh, you can find those on my Patreon page, so patreon.com slash linuxcast. We talk about Linuxy things, and uh, we're, we're doing the news this week, and then starting next week we'll have a little bit of a different format, so look forward to that. Um, but news this week, we all have selected our news items, but before we jump into that, we got to talk about what we've done this week in the open source universe, and uh, Josh, you get to go first. Oh, I got a NixOS developer mad at me, so now I'm installing NixOS. <laughs> yeah. Josh, you piss everybody off. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in this regard, I got him so upset that uh, he is he is going to sit there and he's going to write beginners from scratch documentation as I install NixOS. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, and we're uh, so uh, this is me contributing. Uh, th this is how I contribute. I make a developer really mad to the point where, like, after this podcast, he's going to join me on a Jitsi call, and we are going to be going step by step through installing NixOS, and I'm going to tell him every single one of the issues that I have with the handbook. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one way of doing what it. You did to get him that upset, but also at the same time, I think that's the only thing that most people complain about with Nix is just the documentation's a little all over oh, the place. I have other things to complain about. Mostly with their user base. Um, <laughs> they're all annoying little... Sorry. Oglo, baby? No, Oglo has been way better. I think he gave up on trying to get me to... But someone took his place. Um, either that or he created a secondary ghost account. Oh, um, and Oglo... So and much that uh, you made a video about it. I did. I did. I can't help it. It's just... No, and, I, and Oglo is moving away from NixOS, by the way. <laughs> That, that that's hilarious. <laughs> there goes the mascot, man. How are you supposed to do without the mascot? All right. Uh, <laughs> so Josh pissed off a Nix West developer. It wasn't Wimpy, was it? No. Okay. Uh, Tyler, you, what have you been up to this week, other than having Wayland problems? <laughs> well, I I wasn't having any Wayland. Well, really, in all honesty, I'm not having any Wayland issues. Uh, Daisy does some like really weird shit because uh, it is such a weird game but uh it seems to have issues with like a random crash that happens at about three to four hours into gameplay so it's not an issue at all because you can just restart the game and load back in exactly where you were and it saves and protects you on the server so it's totally fine but i wanted to see if the issue was happening on xorg and i also wanted to go back and see what i did wrong with installing system d on gentoo the last time um <laughs> So I did a reinstall with System D. Did exactly everything that I did last time, and it works. So I don't know what the hell happened last time uh, when it came to Gen Two and System D, but yeah, it's working just like it should. Uh, but DWM is being a real bitch. I almost didn't make it to this podcast because it decided that if I change anything other than the keybinds for already existing, like commands for like dmenu cmd uh term cmd you know like in, in dwm if i did anything other than that in the config file uh it would load dwm but it was broken like it i couldn't do anything um and also if i patched it at all like oh, any so patch we're, so we're on vanilla yes i'm on vanilla dwm right now and uh -huh. um i gotta be honest lacking 
is how I would describe <laughs> it. I do not, there are people out there who genuinely run stock D, DWM, do nothing to it. You, you can't. What? The only way that works is if you ever use just one client at a time. Like, that's the yeah. only way that it works. Because mm. you can't even move something up in the stack without a patch. Exactly. Like, how so. did, What the hell, man? Like, that, that's, why, that's why Dusk exists. It's a DWM fork. Well, Dusk I've is... I've never heard of As it. a guy that prefers using vanilla DWM, I'm going to hold my opinion. <laughs> you should. You should. <laughs> <laughs> What is wrong with you, Josh? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. You use what you like to use. I like Qtel better. Um, anyways, Tyler, are you sure that you have all of the dependencies installed for DWM? Like Xenorama yeah. and all the lib, lib X stuff? Fuck. I'm not sure about the Xenorama thing, but it's okay. I'm only using one monitor over here at this client's house okay. right now. But that is a good uh, thing you pointed that out. Uh, I mean, I don't think it would compile at all without those, so it might not be those. I don't know. That'd be the first place that I'd look, though, is to see if you have the right... Uh, it depends on how he installed DWM. If he did it the suckless way of where it's uh, the git clone pseudo make installed, then, yeah, it's not going to pull in the proper dependencies on Gen 2. But, it, you know, if he was smart and he installed the XORG meta package and then he included Xenorama support in his make.conf like he's supposed to, then it should compile, then it should be fine. I'm looking at his face right now. I'm, I'm doubting his, his, his use flag. I'm, <laughs> my keyboard is terminal. extremely loud, and this iPad seems to pick up everything, so I'm trying oh. to type as lightly as possible. <laughs> okay, Xenorama is in my make.conf, so yeah, we all good. We all good. All right, so that's not the problem. All right, uh, Steve, what have you been up to this week? I was using Waylon. <laughs> Look at his face. It's definitely that's definitely a fake smile. <laughs> no, it's it's a. <laughs> <laughs> I was finally able to log into Wayland. Uh, <clears throat> but you know how the experience went on an Nvidia card. <laughs> yeah. But I was finally. I saw an update. It was called Plasma. Wayland session two. I was like, oh, that's the first time I see two in the name, in the version number. Let me try logging into Wayland. But guess it what? Worked. I discovered why I wasn't able to log in in the first place. <laughs> I have three monitors. And for whatever reason, SDDM. Okay. The nightmarish login manager, display manager, whatever you want to call it. On, it, ha it displays on all three monitors, right? Mm -hmm. There's a drop down where you select between X11 and Wayland. If you do it on a single monitor, it will still consider itself into X11 because on the other monitors, it's, the drop down is still set to X11. You have to set monitor one, monitor two, monitor three in the drop down to Wayland for, to be able to log in. <laughs> Word. S SDDM yeah. is a piece of garbage. Glorious software. <laughs> Glorious <laughs> software. What the heck? And they have, and uh, the development has been active on SDDM Git because I, I have that one installed. And every time I run an update, there's an update for it. We're at two zero dash nine. Up until now, I'm like they're making big strides because uh, Fedora KDE version. Uh, uh, the guy that run, that's behind that, uh, his name's Neil something, but uh, he's he's really been pushing like SDDM development from from Fedora lately, and uh, their their patches are starting to get submitted to SDDM directly now that KDE's taking it over. Yeah. So uh, hopefully SDDM is going to get better. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, hopefully <laughs> they never mention anywhere in any documentation on GitHub or anywhere that multiple monitor users should select. Wayland on all monitors in SDDM before logging in, or else yeah. it's going to think it's still on X11. But we also, like, because I remember us talking about this, Steve, like, it would make much more sense, because, I mean, we talked about this for a while, but it would make much more sense for them to choose one of two options. Either one, SDDM only displays on one monitor. Like, pick whichever one and display on that one, or 
make it just replicate one to all the other monitors. Exactly. Like, like it's, it's such a simple fix. It's, it's like it's it's it, like considering each monitor as a separate instance of SDDM. Like literally, LightDM has had this solved for twenty years. Yes. <laughs> like, like literally, the focus just follows the mouse. That's all that happens. <laughs> and that's yeah. what happens. Like it's like seriously, it's not, it's it's not hard. It, it's not hard. It's not like they're reinventing the wheel. Come on, well, people. I, th- I, I ju- think they want to have their own way of doing things, and they, so they do things in a different way, and it it doesn't work out for them half the time. Also, just just on a side note, completely unrelated. Uh, if you want to have the most stable experience of KDE you've ever tried, install Silver Blue and then rebase it to the U Blue version of Kino White. Oh my god, guys! I haven't had a single problem with, with that. It, like your you screens know, are sleeping the way they should yeah, be sleeping. Yeah, works completely. Like across the board, I haven't had a single crash. I've been using it on that computer now for two months. I have it installed on another hard drive on this one, and I've been and, using it a little bit. And you had to go. And you had to go ahead and jinx yourself. Now you're yeah, yeah. And I know, I know. I'm, I'm very worried about the next time I power up that laptop over there. But yeah, it works fine with multiple screens. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I've had it. I've had good experience. You know me. Uh, I've never had any issues uh, besides the very few. But. Uh, uh, and uh, while I was on Wayland, I noticed how smooth it is, how buttery, buttery, buttery smooth it is. And it respects the refresh rates yeah, for different yeah, monitors. Refresh rate sync, it's amazing. It, it, oh. is, and, and not only that, on, uh, on, on Wayland, even Latte Dock, the dock at the bottom of the screen, was smooth as butter. The animation was smooth as butter. On X11, it's jittery, and you notice it's uh, uh, lagginess. The only problem is... Latte Dock will not uh, uh, respect the primary monitor setting because the primary is this one. It's set to this one. Why the heck is Latte Dock opening on this one? That's not a uh, Wayland problem. That's a uh, that's a KDE problem because KDE has it in XOR as well. And I don't know about specifically with Latte Dock, but I I know with the KDE. Yeah, panel, Latte Dock supports. Uh, uh, it's because it's Latte Dock is actually running under X Wayland because it doesn't have native Wayland support right now. So maybe when you're, when you're a client may- running in X Wayland, the Wayland protocols literally will not tell that uh, client as to which window it's actually on. Oh, that explains. So Latte Dock doesn't support Wayland at all. It does. Uh, it does. They did implement some Wayland features. Well, the not- Arch Linux build is compiled without Wayland support. What? Oh, I'm building from source. I'm building from source. Oh. From mine is Git. I'm building from source. Pro tip: but... use Gentoo. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. No. Thank you. Thank you. Use Gentoo no. to clear minus X. Is just watch how horribly broken your entire system is. <laughs> we are overwhelmed with Gentoo people over here. Save me from the Gentoo people. Save me from the Gentoo people. Ha- hashtag but anyway. Open, open Sousa. <laughs> open anyway. To be fair, to be fair, the only compositor I've been able to get loading on that system so far is sway <laughs> nothing else can load <laughs> and i and i can't load firefox but i can load a terminal besides that my experience on wayland has been lackluster because there's another issue kwin it's it has one one name it's called kwin the effects don't render correctly the uh, you open i maximize a window the effects the blur effect covers the half the screen i cannot click on have anything so Hello, Kwin. Wayland support anytime soon? Better Wayland um, support anytime soon? <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys, but I'm going to have to step away for just a second. I am I am over at a client's house, and I'm watching a puppy, and the puppy is yapping, which means she has to go pee. So I'll be back in just one second. Go ahead, Tyler. I'm right. walking right before this. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you should have anyway. cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Wayland, the, the, ex- the experience on Wayland was good-ish. I was able to use OBS for the first time ever on Wayland on KDE. Uh, I just discovered that it was all on me because I was setting the <laughs> uh, per- <laughs> flatback permissions wrong. Uh, uh, I wasn't s- checking the box that said <laughs> Wayland. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was on me. Uh, but I was able to share screens, record screens, and audio, and share screens and some screens, not all of them. Uh, like for some for some reason, I cannot capture the uh, the screen. Like I open OBS, I want to capture the the video feed from 
Discord, it just gives me a black screen, just black boxes. So is um, XDG Desktop Portal dash KDE installed? Yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> just checking. So, no, it's it's not about that. It's something to do with uh, Ferdium, because you know I use Discord in Ferdium. Uh, so I need to figure that out. But I can log into Wayland. Wasn't Ferdium abandoned? Or was that no? Ferdy Ferdy was killed off because the uh, developer committed suicide. He went crazy, committed suicide. So uh, Ferdium was born from that, from Ferdy, and. Also, the development is slowing down on Ferdium because they're overwhelmed and understaffed. So, so <laughs> they're going to continue working on... Uh, well, they're just working on fixing uh, some issues, but uh, mainly with the fact that if I want to pop up this window, uh, the, the chat window, uh, to see you guys, uh, it opens up in a blank page in Vivaldi. It doesn't open in, in a separate instance of the app. So they're working on that for all in for all services, but beyond that, they're just fixing stuff. No longer working on major features. They don't have time. They don't have the staff. They don't have the money. So um, as usual, but I've been doing a lot of uh, Wayland testing. So when I get the uh, uh, when I get the actual AMD GPU, I'll be able to understand what I'm do what I'm dealing with. Cool. All right. So. Personally, I didn't do a damn thing this week on open source for Linux. I made a couple of videos. I've been I edited a, probably but, about two hundred fifty thousand words this week. This week, so that's by the that's by the way, uh, I commented on your latest video. Thank you for that video. I know where it came from. It came from the same place that I come from with all my rants. But you did a better job than I ever will. Uh, you did some some good. You you worded it right, better than I ever would. I was trying not uh, to piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that video. Thank you. I commented. I don't comment much on videos, but this one deserved a comment I and a long one that. At, that, uh, at that and a like. Ah, thank you. Yes, everybody go right now. Stop. If you're watching live, hit the like button. It really does help the channel. Appreciate that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I didn't just did not have time. to. I did a little bit of ricing. I know we're not supposed to call it that, but I don't care. Um, so I, I've added a couple different themes to my Qtile config and stuff. But other than that... I've done nothing. All right, let's oh, go. Oh, DT moved to DT moved to Qtile. Yeah, he's been to Qtile and back to X mode every once in a while. I saw his video. I haven't watched it. I don't watch a lot of uh, of Linux content anymore, guys. I, I I find that if I watch a lot of Linux content, I steal from them a lot. So <laughs> it's easier not to steal I'll, from them if I don't watch I'll them. Let, I'll let you know uh, in on a secret. I only watch you and Brody. Sometimes DT, if he if he if the uh, subject is interesting, but. Only you and Brody. I still subscribe. I just don't watch very much. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the news, fellas. We got a lot to get through, and um, holy shit, it's four o'clock already. <laughs> 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 we didn't we didn't do a very good job of keeping this one down. It's all right, uh, uh, Tyler. Why don't you give us your first one, please? Oh yes, my first one is uh, Linux Mint is planning a new Edge ISO um, plus you know, the Linux Mint 21.3. Um, but so I, I would, this article doesn't fully explain all of the intentions behind the new ISO other than it's, it's meant for running mint on newer hardware. Um, so it's like I find, the, ed, what, what was it? Advanced hardware or whatever for Memex, the AHS version. Yep. Just uses yep. a new, newer kernel or something? Pretty yeah, much. It, yeah. It's just 6.2 kernel. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's kind of good, but I mean, I feel like if you had, if you've got some really new hardware and you want to load Mint on it, which is fine. I mean, a lot of people only use Mint. Like, it's good. What, what I don't get is, like, can't you, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, can't you just update the, the kernel? Like, install a newer version already? Uh, like, so, Mint, Mint is based off of Ubuntu's LTS release. So, in this case, they're still using that 2204 code base, and they're going to be using the 2404 code base next. Now, uh, what that means is that, uh, of course, the kernel version on Ubuntu LTS is pinned. As in, it's only going to be receiving security and security updates not really mm. going to be do pushing like the feature updates unless like there's something totally fucked so uh 
what will happen is that Ubuntu will occasionally backport our kernel to LTS. Occasionally. But that hasn't happened for 2204 yet. So uh, there is no newer kernel than 6.1 uh, well, available. But wasn't there a tool for like installing newer kernels there, on there's like a PPA but but oh. the PPA but the PPA kernels do not support secure boot which is Hold something on. that they wanted to enable you guys keep talking i'm sorry this puppy is becoming a problem okay <laughs> my 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 question and Josh maybe you can answer this is that so Tyler mentioned it, or maybe it was you mentioned it, a tool that when, when th Whoa. Linux Mint tends to do the tool that? thing instead of doing different versions of their distribution. Like they, no, the Mint way. has yeah, yeah, Mint has a tool of the yeah, last they, time I they used it. They have a tool to do it, but you have uh, you have to be able to run could, it before you can yeah, upgrade. Yeah, you have to be able to run it. Yeah, yeah. So that'd be the pro that's what I was, I was thinking about. I was like, yes, they should they should just do a tool because I mean, like Manjaro has their their kernel tool, right? Like the um that you can go and and change the the kernel. But you have to be able to, if you have the hardware already installed, you have to be able to actually get a... Yeah, it's just people for me, like, you know, I run the Arc GPU and, like, I can't even get a graphical session on a, on a distro ship 6.1. So, that, that's really what it's for. Yeah. So, this is probably what the... My problem with it is that Linux Mint does not need another thing to maintain. <laughs> like, they really, really don't. They're already really bad at doing updates. Um, I know it doesn't seem like they're bad at doing updates, but it just feel it's very... It's very slow for me, but that, that's because Linux has never been for me. It's, it's a useless distro, if, if you will. <laughs> oh, I hello. I love that video, man. The comments <laughs> in that video are so toxic. I love yeah. it. Still not turn. Somebody, somebody messaged me the other day. They sent an email like, will you please turn the comments back on for that uh, video? I was like, no. <laughs> like, that was the worst one ever. Like, I was, someone literally, told, literally said they were coming to kill me. So, no, I won't be doing that. <laughs> uh, anyways, Josh, your first one, please. Oh, my first one. Okay, so uh, Intel's XE driver is getting close to actually being merged into the Linux kernel. Uh, if you guys don't know, the current uh, dr graphical driver for Intel, both ARC and embedded graf graphics chips on, on Linux, is the, is the i915 driver. Uh, this driver's been around for about 15 or so years now, and Intel is trying to deprecate that in favor of the XE driver that they've been working on the past few years. But of course, video drivers are actually kind of hard. And at this point, they they finally managed to get the DRM scheduler, pa scheduler patches in, uh, enabled in uh, the XE driver, and uh, they seem to be relatively working, So, but it hasn't been merged into the Linux kernel stack yet. But what this is going to do is this this is going to enable uh, all of the compute architectures like uh, you know the a the AI cores the the uh, video acceleration libraries need needed uh, to be able to to be able to interact with the hardware and so on. Uh, but uh, it looks like that's that it's very likely to be included in the six point seven kernel because they just missed the they just missed the uh, feet feature freezes for the 6.6 .6 kernel and 6.5 so uh it's still going to be a little while before we actually start to see this driver but uh you know i'm actually kind of excited for it because you know what uh, when you see half these posts where, where you're seeing where uh intel ma managed to make arc, G arc gpu drivers faster or more efficient half of that is actually for the xe driver not i915 mm -hmm. i'm <laughs> constantly surprised at how fast that the arc thing seemed to have caught on with people to be honest with you i first when, you, when, when I first, you have you, you have ahead. to take it from this point of view that uh, the, the reason uh, the arc gpu is picking up steam is because it's the uh, most affordable <laughs> one mm. right now point. in the gpu wars <laughs> yeah. well you know you look at all these gpu review charts that they're posting and then you know they have an a770 there it's on the list it's not quite the top it's not quite the middle sometimes it's, sometimes it's on the bottom side but you sit there and you look at it and then you look at the price compared to all the other cards you're just like that's a hundred dollars cheaper <laughs> yeah <laughs> i did i did fail to take into account that it is cheaper all right uh yeah. steve your first one please it's not KDE related. Yes. Sorry, I was really excited about that. <laughs> no more, uh, no more KDE stuff for for a while, uh, because 
ADE is working on Kick 56, so we'll wait. We'll see what happens. But for now, uh, we'll be talking about something near and dear to my heart. It's KD, uh, XFS. The XFS file system maintainer, I know it's kind of old news, but it's, it was supposed to be talked about last week, but since we didn't have a podcast last week, so my I'm fault. reporting it. To the, not your fault. Oh, good. Shit happens. It happens. Uh, so the uh, the XFS file uh, system maintainer is stepping down due to burnout and things not going as well as they should be, and he got sick of it. But, guys, oh, good. Thank you. People can see proof now that I suffer from power issues. Um, uh, it'll be back in five minutes. Uh, but the... Uh, uh, everything was me- uh, everything is a mess at the offices. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, we can still hear you. I'm just distracted by the too. fact that your headphones glow in the freaking dark, man. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 I do with what I got. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, we can still see you because your headphones are really bright. That's awesome. <laughs> Go ahead, continue. <laughs> Sorry. No. no anyway. <laughs> So uh, even when I don't try to be funny, I'm funny. So <laughs> ah, see, back. Um, please, AC, turn on. I'm so hot. Um, yeah, uh, ADAD, ADHD moment. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, it was a mess and everything. But guys, don't worry. Uh, XFS is not going anywhere. Uh, XFS is still here. It's just he de- uh, delegated a new person. To, to take over the, the maintainership. But unfortunately, it will take some time before they can start working on the features that they had planned because they need to clean up all the mess that they did through, through the years maintaining. Uh, uh, th- th- because he used to, the way he puts it is, because I read the article, I'm speaking from, uh, from, from and more articles, so I'm speaking of combining all of them. So basically, what's uh, what's going on is they need to sift through a lot of mess before because he's been telling them to to do things and they were putting them on uh, aside, not implementing them, and that's what brought the current grub slash XFS issue on that I've been suffering from on on Arch, which still exists. I, I'm just holding back grub to fix the issue, but uh, so that issue came from there is there's a lot of features that were supposed to be merged into XFS progs, were, which weren't, because for whatever reason, they decided to shelve them and to concentrate Sorry, on other things. That's so nice. they need to clean. There's a lot. Of, there's a period of cleanup, a long period of cleanup before uh, it becomes stable. There's a lot of patches. Uh, he, they even link to a pa- the, the patch series that uh, uh, they need to work on. So... Uh, it's not going anywhere. It's just development is going to be very slow on XFS. So don't expect it to miraculously uh, get updated, receive major updates. It's just incremental updates for a long time to come uh, while the new uh, maintainer gets positioned and gets organized and everything. So, but it's not going anywhere. That's why on Zero Linux, XFS has taken third position now. It's no longer the default. So I suffered. Uh, I, now we have to do some compromises, and users prefer ext4. So I made ext4 the top, butterfs the second. Uh, at it's some point, there, but guys. it's getting there. Butterfs at some point will be the default, but I XFS. Mean, I don't know. I, it, this may be an uncommon opinion, but and it doesn't really necessarily have to do with the XF. XFS like article in, in specific but like ButterFS and XFS seem to be like sure they're not the default but I think they're going to be the default in like the next five years like yeah just people have been saying that about XFS for 20 plus years now and then well, Red Hat X- made the default okay. yes I that is <laughs> a totally other statement though because XFS people I remember I remember way back, I don't I don't even know how many years ago it was but I stumbled across this form of like five or six dudes just going back and forth about how xfs is going to be like next year which i think this was like maybe to be fair to be fair until x ext4 was going to be released xfs was actually going to be the planned default file system for ubuntu 
Yeah. And I mean, they do actually have it now as a option. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't, I don't know. XFS dudes have always been extremely positive that it's going to take over as the default, but I don't know. Like when it comes to using XFS, most people don't, are not familiar with the ins and outs of it. And ButterFS seems to have a community that like knows how to educate people a little bit better and like make tutorials and guides on using it. Which, ironically, is what a lot of project developers or maintainers overlook. Uh, you need to build a community of people out there making guides and tutorials. Mm -hmm. If you're thanks, thing... Sousa. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, th thank you, thank you, Open Sousa. Thank you. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they actually paid people to do it. <laughs> it's a smart move, man. It's a really yep. smart move. I want to make but the point except... that X or that Better Butterfest and Snapper together. If it's just pre-installed on something, it's just like the best way to use Linux. It's just the best way to use. Linux. I don't I don't disagree at all with that ideology. It's just that I don't use ButterFS. I uh, I don't care about backups. So uh, if I set it as default, and there's a lot of users, there's this argument that is very correct, is very one hundred percent on point. That users tend to click next, next, next blindly and. Don't care about what is the de and they will use the default whatever comes by default on the distro. They don't read, they don't whatever. They just keep like clicking next to get it get the installation out of the way to get to the desktop. And if I set ButterFS as the default, and I know some people do say that you can use ButterFS without using its features. Yes, but you, you will have yeah, but you will have the uh, sub volume stuff that I don't understand. So maybe if user a user messes up uh, a system that's ButterFS, I won't be able to help. But at some well, point, I will start. You yeah. can just go to YouTube and search ButterFS tutorial. And, I mean, I got to be honest, uh, one of those 15-minute tutorials will definitely explain snapshots and how they work. And or, I mean, not snapshots, sub-volumes. Well. But, uh, if uh, Steve would subscribe to the Ten Lee J YouTube channel, <laughs> I did watch your actually, video. <laughs> well, I did watch your video. <laughs> we're we're going to be posting more ButterFS videos because uh, it is very central to how I to how uh, I do the home lab things, and uh, it's going to be critical that how because um, the first series of videos is going to be all about ButterFS on that series. It's just yeah. that uh, I just well, actually you, need to take time to record it, them. And, an and another big thing that keeps people from trying to use things like ButterFS or things that have snapshotting abilities is snapshots. No one, like, I gotta be honest, I used ButterFS for quite a while. Didn't give a rat's ass about any of the features other than, like, it did have some nice SSD features and, like, optimizations, which is nice, but I didn't really care about snapshots at all. Like, couldn't care less. I, like, I didn't even set them up for, like, the first two weeks I was using it. The first time the first time I messed up a config file and completely deleted it and I hadn't pushed it up to my dot files and I remember that snapshots were a thing, it's awesome. Like, it is it is now, legitimately amazing. Did, so. did you roll back the system or did you just mount the snapshot and then CP the file? Just mount the snapshot. The first time you okay. experience snapshots, it's it's... It's like fucking magic. It's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so, but before, just before we move on, guys, we, we have to always put in like a proviso when we talk about snapshots. Snapshots are not backups unless you set them up to be. Uh, you can set them up for your home directory if you want to, but they're not that by default in most distributions. They just yeah. But before 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 we move on, I just wanted to. Can you limit the amount of snapshots you can create? Yes. 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 Because it's someone, it's one, because, li one line in a config file. Uh, so if you're using Snapper, it's in slash Etsy slash Snapper slash configs, and then right there is all of your snapshot settings. Uh, they're all just plain text files for everything the Snapper is tracking for snapshots. ButterFS assistant or use, will do it too, right, Josh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, ButterFS assistant will, as well as Snapper dash GUI. Uh, yeah, both of I, those can handle them. I uh, I I have Snapper Assistant in Zero Linux, but uh, for ButterFS users. But 
uh, I need to learn how to use that tool because I don't understand anything in it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I look uh, at it, so, I don't understand anything. So to make full use of ButterFS Assistant, you need Snapper set up and configured, as well as yeah. you, al you also need the ButterFS maintenance scripts, so, which is just yeah. PTRF maintenance as package name. So you get yeah. both of those installed, you get their services running, and then uh, the ButterFS Assistant tool should detect that they're running. Yeah, that's what it, I what my it script works does. Literally, like uh, like your Google Voice Assistant, but for but for ButterFS. Yeah. It's, the, the, it's this is really what my nice program. This is what my tool does. Actually, it it uh, installs the ButterFS Assistant and the other one maintenance uh, thing and Snapper, of course, uh, and whatever you need. And then it activates the, uh, it activates the home and the root uh, thing for for ButterFS Assistant. Uh, assistant. And then uh, I don't, uh, when I launched ButterFS Assistant, I saw a lot of settings. I got lost, and I closed it. I never used it again. <laughs> so I was like, what the hell does that do? What does that, what does that thing do? There's no perfect tutorial for ButterFS tutorial. I couldn't find one. Learn Perf Linux TV you can make one, Josh. Kind of um, <laughs> Who? Learn Linux TV. I don't know. I, I don't follow. He, he has uh, like one ButterFS video. He has like seven or eight. I'm pretty sure. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. One. I'm sorry. I'm I'm thinking of Vermano. Um, oh, I'm thinking yeah. of Vermano. Sorry, that was my bad. He, he has a ton of them, like he, he, but they're all Arch, so that help you, Steve. But it doesn't really help with like if if you. Uh, the, I mean, the biggest confusion Arch that a lot of people have is like they read that Fedora uses ButterFS by default, but Fedora does sub volumes in a completely different way than every other distribution does it. So it just. It, I mean. For Debian does it very different from how Fedora does it, which is yes. also very different from how OpenSUSE well, does it. Debian, you have to do it com almost completely manually, from what I've seen. No, so. not really. So, I, I took I took uh, I took the sub volumes. Uh, I created the, the way uh, on Zero Linux we do sub volumes is uh, I took it from I think Garuda. I took their settings and copied them over, and. That's how it create uh, create yeah. because because they know how to do it and they created the developers of Garuda created ButterFS Assistant so from chaotic AUR so uh, I was like if, if they created the tool then they know how to create the sub volume so I created the sub volumes exactly the same uh, the same way as them and apparently it works but I just need to learn how ButterFS Assistant works what each option is I need help. If you guys just, can just, link me to some videos. Just Google ButterFS tutorials. Tr trust no, me. No, not ButterFS tutorial. I said ButterFS assistant tutorial. I know. If you learn how ButterFS works, Butter, Butter, ButterFS assistant will make sense. It's because really... I, want to, uh, I want to limit the amount of us. Uh, if I want to create a script, I want to limit the amount of, because somebody complained. Uh, he was like, I enabled it by default. I enabled Grub ButterFS, whatever. The thing that creates the... Uh, so you the, open the up ButterFS Assistant, you go into uh, the snapshot Yeah, but settings. in the entries in Grub, does that control the entries in Grub too? It will as you run Grub, Grub Update. But what you but what you want to do is you want to... You, I don't think ButterFS Assistant will clean up the snapshots. But what you can do is you can open up a terminal. You can just run uh, sudo snapper-c for like the configuration that you're working on. And then uh, you want to run, I think it's snapper cleanup dash number for like the uh for like the snapshot entries because but can't we do it automatically can't we set it to, yes. the word, to do it yeah, i can't remember how i it, did it but if you have the snapper the time if you have the snapper timeline enabled as well as the snapper cleanup timeline it will automatically clear clear itself up on a weekly schedule i but think i think that's what i did butterfs assistant sure. will let you delete specific snapshots yeah but yeah but the manual update grub yeah oh, but right yeah force update scrub yeah, uh, uh, there's a hook that uh, that creates uh, 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 it's uh, grub butter. It's called grub butter fs or grub butter fs. Uh, grub butter fs is the one that has the snapshots into grub. But if you want, the yeah, one that, that runs the Pacman hook that snap pack grub. Yeah, no, I'm I'm saying it, it's uh, because somebody complained that I ended up with a thousand entries in in my uh, in my grub. Yeah, this <laughs> is was like th we have definitely pointed out the one problem with ButterFS, and it's just its integration with Grub is kind of shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> but at least it works. Why with you good, use OpenSUSE? Uh, it works perfectly fine right out of the box. Uh, so we need. The, we're, 
color me weird. I don't even use Butterfist snapshots in Grub because you know uh, I have no uh, I have no USB keyboard control up until like my operating system boots because you know I'm going through a hub. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gents. Well, we anyway, we have to move on <laughs> uh, my, to your topic. Yeah, my first. What's your topic, sir? My first topic is uh, the 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 Asa, Asahi uh, Linux is moving from Arch to Fedora as their base. Now, this was apparently always planned, so this was not something that is actually like new news, but except for that, it's actually happened now. So they're moving from the Arch Linux arm. Uh, remix to the to Fedora Arm, and this seems like can, can somebody? I, maybe this article explains, and I just didn't read all the way through. But did they explain why they didn't just choose Fedora to begin with, Josh? Uh, they they initially went with Arch because Arch is that rolling base, and they want to be able to keep relatively close to upstream on a rolling system, and not have to deal with anything. And Fedora Rawhide is not a very good development environment. No. It's a good. It's a good operating system development environment, but it's not a good driver development environment. Uh, because, you know, uh, with Rawhide, they're just throwing packages left and right at you, almost like you're running Arch's testing repository, which, by the way, is something you should never, ever do. But uh, they, they wanted a relatively stable base that's still relatively close to upstream, which is why they were working with Arch initially. Plus, it's also kind of easy to set up, a, set up an installation image for Arch Linux. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. Arch ISO is a great tool for that. Uh, Fedora doesn't really have anything like that. But uh, the main reason why they're switching to Fedora now is because Fedora uh, is probably the one distro that actually contributes the most directly to the Linux kernel itself, which is which is uh, why they're doing this. That said, I have an issue with this article because the very first sentence is objectively wrong. <laughs> Where it says Red Hat's community Linux distribution, Fedora. Fedora is not the community uh, Linux distribution of Red Hat. It's actually a separate project that's sponsored by Red Hat. There's a difference. (laughs) Yeah, it's not well worded, but I I I understand there. Although... In the in the italics with Red Hat attempting, uh, helping us IU Linux develop software for porting Linux to run on Apple ARM Silicon, how long before Red Hat Enterprise Linux supports Apple hardware? Um, that's never going to happen. Um, yeah, uh, could you imagine someone <laughs> just running RHEL on a on a M2 MacBook? I, other than just why, I'd be like, what? I mean, it's, like, it's all about. I mean, I understand why they do, but it seems like such a small thing for them to i don't know it's, it feels weird to me i don't think that that's something that but I, I, I might be wrong about that what do you think josh you think they're actually going to to do it i see well, the way red, he's red, looking on his face i swear uh, to god if you tell me that pine phone's running rel we're gonna have problems it is, is it really is it running rel <laughs> get out of here dude what he, he's like i yep. pay for it i might as well uh, use it <laughs> uh yeah uh so uh I had a Red Hat employee sit, build an image for the Pine Phone for me and ship it to me. Because <laughs> he's just like, you got a Pine Phone? I have it built for you. And it's like, okay, sure, I'll try it. <laughs> Is it Because uh, I was talking to you on it yesterday. <laughs> oh, that's true. I forgot that. <laughs> you were call- I was calling you on rail. <laughs> this is so weird. <laughs> But yeah, uh, so ARM is actually a rather growing market in the server space. So it makes sense to actually port a very popular ARM architecture to your operating system when you know you're the number one platform for servers. If you're doing, if uh, you know people are coming to you for enterprise support. Hmm. So in this case, it actually does make sense because. Uh, re- there's a lot of development shops on, in the enterprise space that it, that is running enterprise Linux of some form, whether that be CentOS, Alma Linux, Rocky Linux, Red Hat proper, or even CentOS Stream. It actually, it it actually does make some amount of sense. That way, you know, they're not having to go through like that virtual machine thing that they do to like run x86 uh, code. So their their work on on the Apple stuff is going to correlate at least somewhat to making it work better on just general ARM. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. That make uh, that make that makes that makes way more sense to me than do, them doing it just because, you know, Joe Schmo and IT wants to use an, uh, a MacBook. You know. Yes. Yep. But it is also, and I don't want to gloss over this. It is a little concerning 
that a Red Hat developer is spending his time building Pine phone builds and shipping them out <laughs> to people like Josh. Here's my theory. <laughs> Josh just annoys them so much they've actually assigned one dude to be uh, the liaison no, for Josh. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I've never met this guy before. He he just sent me an email one day. He goes like, "Hey man, I I heard that you got a Pine phone because you know he he's a, he's in the Pine sixty four community, and he knows that I'm a customer." <laughs> I, I just thought that there'd be a, a Josh liaison at Red Hat just there to take his questions. <laughs> that, <laughs> not quite. that would make a lot of sense. Uh, not not quite. <laughs> That'd be funny though. <laughs> I I did I did apparently almost have a Rocky. Rocky uh, representative, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, moving on to the contact information real quick. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so. Head on over to the website at thelinkscast.org. There you'll find previous episodes all the way back to season one, uh, as long, along with several blog posts that I've managed to post over the course of the last couple of years. That's usually where they, where I do my blog posting. So thelinkscast.org is where you'll mm-hmm. find that. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash linuxcast. Tyler is on YouTube. He does have a YouTube channel. He he visits there twice a year um, just to make sure mm-hmm. that it still exists. Uh, he, he's on YouTube at YouTube.com slash ZanyOG. He also has a Matrix server, uh, and we'll uh, link to that somewhere as well. I think that's on the on the website somewhere. Josh, you can find all of his contact information at tenleyj.com slash stalker. Steve is on Mastodon at Fostodon.org slash at zero Linux zero with an X. Uh, you can email the podcast, and we do, I do actually read the email. Uh, email at thelinuxcast.org is the email address. And finally, you can find all of this stuff. If you don't want to uh, mess around with actually typing things, you can go to thelinuxcast.org slash contact there. You'll find all of the links that I just told you about, along with uh, my links to Odyssey and uh, PureTube and all of those things right there on the website. So head on over there uh, and uh, be happy about it. Because there's a lot of good stuff there. The, the the website, linuxcast.org, is where you'll find that stuff. So, moving on to the second half of our news, we have uh, four more things to talk about. Tyler, why don't you tell us your second link, please? All right. We're going to try to go through this pretty quick because we've... we've Definitely gone about, over, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, we've talked about Red Hat a little bit too much, not just this stream, but for the past, like, forever. So, uh, Oracle, SUSE... And CIQ, which I'm going to be honest, can one of y'all help me? Who the fuck is that? They're the people behind Alma. Oh, okay. Okay. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're starting the Open Enterprise Linux Association, which uh, from this point on I'll refer to as Open ELA. Um, the Open ELA people are, you know, they're going to, uh, well, they're going to do a source code repository to try and, you know, not be Red Hat. Which is cool, but I do love how this article starts out in a groundbreaking move. These three companies have come together to announce the formation of uh, Open Enterprise Linux Association, which um, I don't think this is a groundbreaking move. Uh, three different groups of like Linux people get together and making an association or you know whatever an organization that's not groundbreaking. This happens literally every week. Probably it's groundbreaking that's registered in Delaware, though. Uh, also, um, <laughs> ZD, ZDNet literally got in trouble like three weeks ago for, um, uh, once again, using AI to write their articles. So <laughs> are we surprised that it's, it, that it's written in a over-the-top manner? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although so, this is this is SVG, oh, SVN, so probably not. Behind Rocky, not Alma? I thought it was behind Alma because uh, Rocky has its own thing. I don't know. It, it really doesn't matter. It, Three it's groups of, of Linux people mm. have gotten together to challenge Red Hat. And cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's fine. So to some people, this is like big news. Um, I don't think so at all. It's just hey, it's hey guys, be another option. Up, hey, hey, guys, 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 hot news. Upstream did something we don't like, so we forked it. <laughs> exactly. That's this is, that's exactly what's happening here. There's nothing big or groundbreaking here. Uh, it's just we all knew this was going to happen. Somebody was going to get together. Well, we really didn't know anyone was going to get together, but there was definitely going to be some moves to get around Red Hat. The and only is, thing I really want to see that this group does is if they actually contribute upstream to CentOS Stream and Fedora proper. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up. Here is what the Open ELA will be delivering the following 
uh, or they'll be delivering the following things that I say here by the, the year's end. All, necess- all sources necessary to achieve a one-to-one, bug-for-bug compatible version of EL, um, this will distribute, uh, be distributed via Git encouraging community ca- collaboration, uh, security errata data, uh, compatibility guidelines for downstream distributions to test their build results, a branding kit for all downstream distributions and supporters, which that one I... Okay, sure. Um, and the other one, user and administration documentation, Oracle con- contribution. So Oracle is going to be writing a whole bunch of documentation, which is probably a good thing. Um, I mean, at least at least when people get paid to write documentation, there's a chance that, you know, there's an editor involved who's going to make sure that, you know, shit's spelled right. right. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be good. Um, the branding kit for all downstream distributions and supporters, I don't understand um, at all, but sure, all right. So I think the biggest one is just they want to achieve one-to-one by the end of the year, which is, I don't think that'll be too difficult, so I'm pretty sure they're they're going to be able to do that one without problem, but I don't know. Uh yeah, so Red Hat drama that's not really drama at all, and it's also definitely not groundbreaking. Um, it's just a new project in Linux, which literally happens probably six times a day. So there you go. There's my that, That's my piece of news, juicy news for the day. Yeah, okay. Uh, Josh, your next one, please. Oh, uh, well, you know, Speaking of Red Hat, <laughs> uh, this, this is actually a Red Hat good guy article here uh, because a Red Hat is hiring somebody to work on Grub. <laughs> That'll be good. And uh, we all know that this is Red Hat being good good guy Red Hat because not a, not a lot of open so- source developers actually work on a specific project or actually paid. Now uh, Red Hat is hiring to pay somebody to work on Grub. And because, uh, of course, as Steve might have noticed, there's uh, Grub. Grub development is a little <laughs> tricky when it comes to like file systems that nobody really actually actively uses. Maybe, maybe they can uh, talk so, to the Arch guys and have them not ship a development version. I'm just yeah, maybe. <laughs> but at the same time, when was the last time Grub actually had a point release? <laughs> uh, that is a good point. <laughs> All right, so trivia time. When was Grub two release? I'm just curious. Ooh, I, I don't even, I even know the question. But I don't, I don't it's even know. Been a minute. I'm guessing. Yeah. I'm guessing 2012. I'm guessing. June 8th, 2021. The last stable release of Grub 2.06. No, no, no. We're talking about Grub 2. Like, not, yeah. not any point releases. Yeah. Uh, that is Grub 2. Oh, no, 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 no. Like Grub 2.0. Grub one, when was it really? Yeah. There was no Grub 2.0. One to two. It was 2.06. Because yeah, 2.0 they're... was a development release. Uh, wait, wait, wait. The confusion. On. The the confusion. The I know where the confusion is coming from. <laughs> on Arch, they call they call Grub two just Grub version two dot zero six. No, 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 no. That's that's not the confusion. The confusion is Grub Grub two when it like two point oh. No other yeah, point 2. releases. Two point oh. Two point oh was a development release. Two point oh six was the first stable release. Really? Yes. So, Everyone who was using Grub 2 was on development for years? Yeah. In fact, if you're okay. on if you're on Arch Linux or even Fedora, you're still using a development snapshot of Grub. Yeah, because they just released uh, version 2.12 RC1, the release yep. candidate. Wikipedia so, is completely what, useless. Yeah, <laughs> Wikipedia is a little tricky on this one, but you, what, what you actually need to be looking is at the Grub project page proper. Yeah, well, uh, and I talked to the developers because of the issue uh, with XFS. I talked to the developers. One of the developers sent me an email, a private email for whatever reason, not on the, <laughs> so okay. it doesn't show up on the uh, on the thing. GNU, he was like, sorry, Steve, just one second. GNU Grub version 2.00 was officially released June 26, 2012. Okay, that was when it was released. Yep, Chess put it in chat too, so... <laughs> Sorry, Steve. What were you saying? Yeah, you're about right. Go yeah, ahead. that was good. Well, 
uh, the 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 developer him uh, one of the developers of the maintainers of Grub whatever uh, from Oracle contacted me via private email so it doesn't show up on the mailing list and he was like go back to dot two dot zero six what are you doing on two dot twelve RC one I was like Arch is shipping it on their stable uh, repos he was like we need to t- we need to have a talk with Arch people. I was like, "Good luck, see ya." <laughs> yeah. 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 Do they, I mean, there's a lot of things with Arch. Does oh, Arch explain ahead. why they do that? Because they've been doing that for a long time. No, no, no. Like, no. You like will some... not get a straight answer from them. Well, it's pro- we tried. Probably because someone, when they made the decision, just made the decision for a reason and then didn't communicate that reason with everybody else. Well, it's not an Arch Linux developer that packages Grub. It's a community member. So it's, it's really that community, member. and his packages are included into Arch Linux's repository. Uh, I I can't remember if it's an extra or if it's in core, but that but uh, the, it's entirely that package maintainer's uh, responsibility to update Grub because uh, mm-hmm. that's how Arch Linux operates. The team does not work together. The yes, time that they and work also together in is that, when... for that one guy in his defense. Arch is supposed to be rolling release, and if his whole goal is to make sure that every update that's pushed upstream gets into Arch, he's technically not doing anything wrong. He's doing exactly yeah. what he should. But do why did why did he switch? Why did he switch to to the development branch? Probably hardware Te- enablement for a new motherboard version that he that he happens to own. Who knows? Well, or okay. even that as a maintainer, like. We all know some maintainers, obviously, in this not just out, not just in this call, outside of this call. Most maintainers, if you receive someone saying that there's an issue with the current version or whatever, and they can't figure out the problem, and you don't know exactly where it's happening, odds are, if you update to like a development branch or just a newer version, most likely it'll fix it. So that's always the first thing you try. So. That's probably what he did. Was just to, in the development it, branch. There's newer hardware supported, or and it got stuck fixes. there. And it got uh, and it got and they decided to stay there <laughs> to yeah. follow the development branch. Yep. Could be. Could be. Could be. Because I've done it before. Uh, I, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not immune to that. Uh, I chose uh, a lot of times. I chose uh, Git versions, development versions over stable uh, versions from AUR. Because they are constantly updated and they have less issues than the stable versions. For whatever reason, they port back issues to the stable versions instead of the uh, keeping them in the development version. I, I don't <laughs> get it. Like, for example, Latedoc, we're using the Git version because the developer himself, before leaving uh, the project, he said, everybody stop using the stable version, use the development version. It Actually, I, I know we do need to move on with the the topics, but I will just say very quickly, I think that this is something that's happening in development a lot more nowadays is people just using what, like, or developers just using development branches for everything. Um, like, yeah. this is, I'm not throwing shade at Hyperland, but Hyperland's guilty of this. Like, like you pretty SD, much SD, need uh, to use the Git version. As SDDM Git as well for Wayland. Yeah. It, it's becoming it's becoming more normal than not Qtile, to, have, to like be required. Qtile, Qtile, well, big one. Qtile has been doing this since September. They haven't had a release since September of last year on the stable branch. If you want the most recent stuff, you get the Git version, and even then, you don't get everything. Which it's they're they, they're yeah. really weird right now. Um, nobody knows what's going on with Qtile. All right, guys, we do have to move on. So, Steve, your last topic, please. My last topic is also a quick one. It's just. Uh, finally, Arch moves on to uh, moves on with Python and up the, and pushes the commit that was uh, pushed and used by Ubuntu for months. But Arch, for whatever reason, it's it's the PEP six six eight to be exact. Uh, for whatever reason, Arch took their sweet ass time to to move to that thing. Uh, but they finally did. But with, uh, not without controversy, because there was no guide about it, there was no announcement about it, so users kept on installing, py- uh, trying to install Python packages uh, via Python da- space install 
something.py, whatever, or something, so this is, whatever. So this isn't the thing that's going to mask pip for, and make people use pip picks? That's not the, what this is? The, this is this is what it is. Oh, it is. So, okay. Oh. Yeah. So 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 basically so basically the right way to install things is if you have to you have to create a virtual environment because mm -hmm. the way Python works now is so it doesn't mess with your system. Uh, I did watch the Brody video. That's where my information comes from. Uh, <laughs> so and I understood it for for once in my lifetime. I understood something uh, because I use it. So. Basically, what the, the, because before the way things used to happen is pip install, but if the package you're install the Python package that you're installing has dependencies that it installs as well, but you already have those dependencies installed by Arch, uh, uh, let's say by uh, your package, your distribution package manager, they were going to conflict, and this is going to take over that one and whatever. So they what uh, Python did. They created the virtual environment thing where it will install without touching your system, without messing with your system. It will do everything for you in a virtual environment. But what what is the disadvantage? Because that comes at a disadvantage where PipX fixes that disadvantage. Is uh, you have to do the make uh, make depend make build uh, whatever kind type of thing. So and then you have once you have your binary build, you have to do the uh, desktop thing and have. To put it, uh, put it into user bin, then symlink it to user bin, and all that shenanigans. Whereas pipx, you just pipx install the package you want, and it does, that. It does all the virtual environment stuff for you without even you noticing or doing anything about it. So more people are moving towards pipx from the regular Python. Well, but it, mo a lot of distributions, specifically for sure Debian-based distributions, have it just completely masked off. You can't use pip at all. Uh, unless you work your way around oh, it, uh, so. Well, and in, in, in Arch, it's not that way because uh, also uh, there was Brody in his video. He mentioned one thing, and I noticed this a lot on Stack Exchange, where they tell you just delete the extremely managed file yeah. and bypass that, or run the the flag break my system. I'm like, oh, you're telling people to break their system. Well, oh, really, there, Stack there Exchange, are... what the fuck are you doing? In the def in their defense, a little bit in, in with some specific Python packages like Qtile, you can't install that with pipx. You can't do it. It has to be installed with pip. Oh, so and so like if you want to run Qtile on Debian, you have to run that break packages or you have to delete the extern externally managed flag in order to actually install Qtile. But once you have Qtile installed, you can re-enable that so that you don't mess around with anything else. Of course, oh, then um, updating Qtile would be a pain in the ass, but that's another story. Oh, maybe for some packages, but it's not recommended. Well, no. Well, it's still not. No, no. <laughs> it's not, definitely not something that a new user should be messing around with. Um. But but I do agree with the pipx uh, solution. I would have done I would have done the same thing. I would have ma ma uh, created an alias. Basically, I would have aliased the whole thing into created the script and aliased it to, to, to something. But pipx did that for me. So why do that now? Yeah. So people switch to pipx on at least on Arch. It'll save you all the hassle. But be careful what you're installed. <laughs> That's it. A quick article. Yeah. Okay. It so, the... yeah, mine should be pretty quick as well. So, LXD about a month ago was pulled into uh, Canonical as an official Canonical project, and as far as we can tell, that this was done against the will of the actual like head maintainer of the LXD project. So, there's been controversy. Mm -hmm. We have we haven't actually covered it mostly, and I don't know all the details, so you'll have to forgive me about about it. So, I've, I've just been basically reading some articles on it. But, anyways, the point of this article here is that it has been forked into a different project so that there's a version that is still community maintained uh, and uh, as Fox Force here so there's been a bit of a soap opera uh, but we'll so this is another instance of a, of a corporate distro taking over a project and doing something that the community disagrees with and then the community forking the project uh, to carry on with the way that it was before so uh, I the the link for this particular article will be in the the show notes. So if you want to read the backstory, Phosphorus does a fairly good job of talking about what what has happened so far, um, and, and they have some links which they don't always do a good job with. Um, source links is not their uh, 
a forte, but they have done a pretty good job in this instance. Um, basically, the news is, like I said, the, the LXD has been forked, and um, hmm. that's the way that it'll carry on. But, of course, the Ubuntu version, or the canonical version, will carry on as well, and probably will continue to be the, the main version for all eternity. Because when was the last time hmm. that a fork actually continued on and ended up being more popular than the you know the parent it's been a long long time no. i don't think there's been a, a good example in quite a while hmm. technically element is a fork of riot speaking of that Tec- uh, they really need to change the flat pack name of, of element it still says riot they do. Is this the- <laughs> yeah <laughs> come on uh If anybody knows it's gonna be Josh. I'm trying to think. I guess Duaz is actually relatively popular. Which Duaz is a fork of another privilege escalation pro- project that was initially started by OpenBSD. Uh. Yeah, no, I, is, I really can't is think it just of too me? much. Does anyone know how to access? the CLA. I didn't even know Canonical had a CLA uh, at all. I can't I can't figure out where in the hell you read it. Well, on their website. Can yeah, I can't uh, access I... it. I don't even know how to read it. Because when I go to sign it, <laughs> they just have all the information to sign it there. They don't even show you the fucking agreement that you're signing. Uh... Yeah, it's, that really is all it is, too. Requires requires a GitHub account. <laughs> and then you got to <laughs> sign up before they even send it to you. Uh, no. <laughs> shady, 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 shady things. Uh, so you sign up with your contact information, but that is not signing up in agreement with the CLA. So you have to give them their contact details, and I guess they just emailed the license agreement to you. <clears throat> but uh, for the community member that does not actually know what an LXC container for is or an LXD container, uh, basically it's sort of like Docker, but there's a scope difference between the two projects. Whereas Docker is an application container, LXD is a system container. So when, you, so uh, if if say that uh, you want to be super creative and you want to spin up a whole separate operating system on your system but you want something that's lighter than a dedicated virtual machine. And you want it to be as close to bare metal as you could possibly get without it actually being bare metal. That's an LXC container. Uh, basically, yeah. this is how Bedrock Linux actually works. So if you've ever uh, heard or even looked at that project before. And uh, what, that, what that enables is it, is it enables true direct hardware communication between the container and the host operating system and, and the drivers. So in, say, like my case where I'm I'm the Gen 2 guy, I actually do run an LXC container for Gen 2 as a dedicated package building server uh, rather than a virtual machine because I find that the compile times are actually much faster because then I don't have to deal with the uh, CPU scheduling, uh, you know, deprioritizing my virtual machine as my virtual machine is compiling. Josh, <laughs> you're such a nerd. I'm, I'm so in awe of you. You're welcome. Also, um, two good examples of forks that were more proper, more... Popular LibreOffice and NeoVim. Thank you, chat. Um, oh right, I I forgot about LibreOffice. You're right. Yeah. It's been a while and since I've that, used that it. That was I before. Need... Before we get to the end, I do want to go ahead and just cut in and say for anyone who is uh, checking out the Ubuntu CLA, uh, the agreement form that Josh was saying you probably just got to fill out and they sit, they email you. Uh, that's not how it works at all. Because uh, oh. if you read it at the bottom, it's like when you click "I'm not a robot" and click "I agree." By clicking "I agree," you uh, you accept the terms detailed above, and the terms above are "I'm signing as an individual contributor" or whatever. So yeah, you are signing the form without reading the document, and I find it that... extremely sketchy that I cannot find any. That's not only sketchy; that's borderline uh, legal issue in the United States. <laughs> Contract yeah. law is a pretty big deal here. Yeah. So, uh, just in case anyone wants to, for whatever reason, take uh, take this license agreement to court, I have a <laughs> pretty damn good feeling you'll win. <laughs> so, just saying. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and move on to the last 
part of the podcast. We call this section the thingies of the week. We could have called it anything like apps of the week or tips of the week or tricks of the week or whatever, but those were all tra- trademarked and we wanted to come up with something unique. Um, so, Tyler, your thingy of the week, please. Ah, uh, yes. Mine I didn't even put in the document. I noticed that, you I lazy knew, SOB. <laughs> you know, well, I, I, knew if I, I knew if I put it in there, uh, I would immediately start the podcast out with like a whole bunch of, what? Like, you're going back. But I do want to say, Xorg is my thingy of the week. <laughs> only for, if you're going to be playing, like, not necessarily really old, but, you know, like, we're talking five to ten years old, games that are multiplayer and have all, like, they don't have really good ratings on on Steam for, like, their support and stuff, like DayZ. Um, I'm just going to recommend you stick with Xorg. For right now, because what I have found out is you are going to have to set some environment variables that you're probably not familiar with at all for it to be totally 100% stable, uh, which is one thing that I'm, I also kind of want to go off on a, on a divergent street for just one second. Um, we need a way when way, if Wayland is truly going to be the standard or at least push for it being the standard. We need a way of like uh, it managing environment variables for new users that is like super easy to understand and toggleable. Like we need a graphical user interface for setting environment variables for Wayland or Xorg for new users. That is a tool that like it needs to exist for Wayland. That is because a lot of <laughs> things right now are controlled by environment. Yes. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, Tyler. That was good. That was really good. <laughs> we definitely need one. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> Th- thank you, Tyler. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Well, if, Don't if get too excited because to, I didn't say I'm going to do it. If <laughs> I'm you just talk to the Wayland it. developers, they're going to tell you that's the issue. That that's that's the responsibility of the compositors to do that. The compositor is going to tell you that's a, that uh, it's the responsibility of the application maintainers to do that. Exactly. Which, you know, asking application maintainers to manage environment variables. Eh, that's a, What's, that's a it's that's about a time. Open source developers stop acting like fucking cell phone companies and transferring you to different departments. Just, just <laughs> okay, fucking let's fix specifically it. Just talk somebody fix it. About OBS, because OBS has to have that environment variable in order to work on Wayland. Like it has to have mm-hmm. it. And the fact the and the fact mm-hmm. that It does. Oh okay, so what the the OBS environment variable is actually a build flag you can enable in the in the uh, make file. Okay. You just yes. sit there, you set it. All right, all right. And everybody who's works. not compiling OBS from source, stop listening from Josh right now. <laughs> uh, it, it's the issue of your package maintainer in that case. All right. Well, I'm just I'm just saying that until OBS or whatever whoever decides to make that default and enabled by default when you're running Wayland, like. It is. Seriously, like it has to be like an if statement or something. I don't know. I'm not a developer, but until that's default, Wayland isn't ready. I'm sorry, it's just not. It is. Uh, it is default in OBS Studio. It wasn't for me. It. It is upstream. It's been it's literally. Been if you run the flat pack, you have to have the environment variable. You have to set it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Flatpak as is far the, as I know, that's an issue with Flatpak. Flatpak is the official it's, version of OBS on yes. Linux. Well, then you need Thank to op- you. Uh, somebody needs to open an issue on the uh, OBS GitHub and let them know that hey, uh, Wayland is not enabled on a Flatpak because it it should be enabled. Okay, the, <laughs> we're not getting into this. Josh, you're you're thinking of the week, please. <laughs> oh, my thing of the week is this Pine Phone because you know it's it's running Red Hat right now. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in the, okay. Uh, the story of this Pine Phone is fun uh, because I bought this is the commu- this is the KDE edition Pine Phone. Uh, it I initially bought it using the very first public release of Plasma Mobile. Absolute garbage, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Manjaro and I just don't work. <laughs> uh, like uh, Manjaro is worse than Arch Linux in, in my experience. Manjaro but, and uh, most people don't work. It's just. Yeah, uh, so then I uh, spun up Void Linux on it. It ran Void Linux for a little while. And uh, then I ran Mobian with, using Fosh for the longest time. And now I'm running Red Hat with actual proper GNOME on my Pine Phone. 
This is why I don't have a Linux phone because I'd be distro hopping on my my Linux phone like every other day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know it works. Uh, like I can send uh, as Zany found out, I can call him. Uh, text messages work. MMS messages work. Uh, I haven't gotten Bitwarden working on it, so I can't really log into like uh, my Matrix services. But you know. Uh, with MMS support actually working properly, I no longer had to spin up a uh, Matrix server on my Pine phone just to be able to receive an MMS message, which is great. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I used to have to do. <clears throat> but uh, uh, the only thing I'm still working on getting right now is GPS turn-by-turn -turn navigation. But I do have GPS location detection working. So uh, I know that it can work in theory. I'm just uh, just working on getting it to work properly. But uh, I can almost say that uh, Linux Mobile is kind of is almost like that very first gener er generation era of smartphone usable at this point. Like it's getting there, it's getting there. It's a uh, it, the development is slow, yes, but it is getting so much better. Cool. And uh, honestly, I'm at this point I'm more excited for like the fact that I've been using this phone solid for like uh, a month and a half now. I'm more excited for this than I am the Arc GPU. And that's saying something. All right. Yeah. Steve, your thingy of the week, please. I have to apologize first because I forgot to update the docs uh, to change it because uh, last week I just put, I was lazy. I put whatever came to my mind. But during that week, I discovered an app. And I need to talk about it. I forgot to update the doc. I do apologize, Matt. But it's a simple app called VVV. 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 V V V like literally three no. V's. No V V V for uh, like uh, victory. V V V. Uh, and what? How do you, uh, how do you spell it? V V V. That's what <laughs> that's, triple V. Oh, okay. What Tyler just said was three V's. Yeah, so three V's. Three V's like uh, the, the first letter of victory. <laughs> we're we're having um, a very weird conversation right now. I feel like we wandered into uh, a... V V V is short for virtual volumes view. Yes. Okay, Steve, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> okay, so virtual volumes view. Uh, on Windows, I, I used to use something called Wing Catalog. Uh, if you go to wingcatalog.com, you will see it. But uh, what, th what that does, basically, it, it catalogs the contents of CD drives, DVD drives, flash drives, hard drives, whatever. Uh, so, uh, but Wing Catalog is a Windows application. I was able to run it on Linux using Wine, and with I have the portable version, uh, and it works just fine via Wine. But I didn't want to share my library, uh, my my database, and have users download a Windows version to run via Wine. So I was looking for an alternative for Linux. And who comes to the rescue? Alternative two, of course. Uh, I searched for a Win Catalog. It showed me the first result was VVV, <laughs> Virtual Volumes View. Uh, so I found it on the AUR, compiled it, put it on my repo, installed it. It was awesome because it's 10 times lighter than Win Catalog. It doesn't have all these unnecessary features. Uh, it just catalogs your hard drive, whatever drive uh, contents, because you can catalog it, create a catalog. It's .vvv at the end, very smart. Uh, and you can share it with people online, which I did on my private post, xzero.com. Uh, I shared my game's hard drive uh, contents. Uh, all they have to do is install this via Yay if they're not on Zero Linux or via Pac-Man if they're on Zero Linux. Download my uh, catalog, open it with this app, and they will be able to browse my my hard drive contents without being on my hard drive. They just It's like a file manager, like Thunar or whatever. Just you're browsing for, for folders that are not actually on your system. They're just content indexed by VVV. So uh, I like that because I was able to share my <clears throat> a question mark, question mark uh, uh, games drive uh, uh, with, uh, with the public to see wh what games I have uh, and all the GOG game collection I have. Some of them legit, some of them Definitely not. all of them uh, legit. Questionable. <laughs> <laughs> All of them are legit. <laughs> Don't listen to a YouTube demonetization bot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to, to be serious, it's it combines everything. All my games, however uh, method I got them. But uh, it's just 
uh, some of them I just backed up from Steam. Can it do s- I don't specific know. directories, or does it have to be a whole drive? It can do specific directories, yes. Huh. Uh, directories, drives, thumb drives, CDs, DVDs, whatever. Uh, I, you would, just point, I would definitely you just point find it, that useful. Because you just could catalog point it, all of your... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You can point it to anything. It will catalog that. And the best feature of this thing, you can search your catalog. In case you lost something or you, you have something on an external drive, you can even catalog an external drive. So if you have something on an external drive and you don't remember uh, and you have multiple external drives, you can just fire up this application, open up the, uh, the, the the catalog and search. You will find it. Once you find it, you know which drive it is on. But the only problem that the bug that this tool currently has is double. Even though you uh, first you have to associate the uh, VVV file with the app. I don't know why you have to do it manually. It doesn't take it over automatically. But once you associate it, if you have, let's say, three catalogs, you double click on one catalog, it opens it up in the, in the app, and then you double click the other one, it will still be stuck at the first one. It will not reload to the new. You have to select file, open, and open the new catalog manually. But besides that uh, bug, because the last time it was updated was in 2021. I don't know why. But uh, it works. I was able to search and find my games and everything so it, it's perfect it's perfect for what i need and uh, i have a lot of drives i got 20 drives in one computer i got seven drives in this one i got 25 in the other one so <laughs> um it helps a lot uh, to catalog things and uh, i recommend it for people and it's available for linux mac os and Windows. cool all right for, for linux that would be uh, for, definitely useful for cataloging all of your usb drives like if you're like yeah. me and got like fucking 20 of them bitches and you uh, never know where they are you can if you pick up one you're like i don't know if this has the stuff i need on it you can check in your catalog that, that's pretty nice. i was thinking on that it would be really good for tracking the installed packages and then publishing them to like a website somewhere like a GitHub repo like not the actual package themselves but the names that way if you need to reinstall you have all the names of the stuff that you had installed i don't know if it can, can catalog oh, pa- installed packages but well, it could, if you if you tracked your uh bin folder well uh yeah bin fo- the bin folder has more than bin there's, has there's millions Josh? other ways to do it to do this like uh i think it's like a uh, pacman dash qns or yeah, something like well, that well, all the oh, yeah. installed what i was thinking of it is uh, that you could run that command like as a cron job like every week or whatever put it into a text file in a, d- a directory and then have this thing yeah you know. but then uh, you yeah, just put no, it, in, no, like, it, page. Probably over. in the land of gen 2 in your slash var directory there's this file called world you can just do the same thing with that too josh <laughs> I completely agree with where you're going. Not everyone uses Gentoo, you. you morons. <laughs> it's called open. No, but it's the, called the, open the, Sousa. The... Sorry. Who needs? Yeah, <laughs> but this one, this one is made for cataloging just uh, some things like that, like games and music would be good too. Yeah. Music, music, and videos, and TV shows, I mean, and stuff uh, like that. The H Network actually does raise a good point here. This is great for like a NAS setup, where it's just like maybe you don't. That's have what I'm using it for. Greatest, uh, file folder structure, and uh, you know, I I can understand sometimes you just dump things on a NAS, and you, then you forget many years <laughs> yeah. later of where you put it. That's uh, that's <laughs> the system that I have to. Uh, that's the system where I have the twenty drives in. Yeah. That's what I'm using it for, actually. So it's a perfect tool, and it's very light. It's very simple. It just runs, works, search, done. All right. Got the log search. My thingy of the week is one that I've used before and recently. I'm choosing DistroBox again. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm going to, I will probably use this as a thingy probably five or six more times because this, I cannot get over this tool. It is so fucking cool. Um, I couldn't even install it on Arch. Thank you. Skill issue. Um, <laughs> no. All right, so my browser right now, I'm going to actually show my browser on screen right now. You guys will be able to see this, but everybody else, this is Vivaldi, okay? It looks like it's running on OpenSUSE, but it's not actually running on OpenSUSE. It's running on Arch, okay? Because the OpenSUSE doesn't have it in its repositories, and if you download the RPM of the Vivaldi, it keeps fucking breaking. It's horrible. Don't don't ever do it. Um, so what I did is Wait, I... Vivaldi shit? I didn't know that. <laughs> no, 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 the, the <laughs> RPM is it's, it's bad. I don't know what they're doing to it. They're they're not doing something right there, but it doesn't matter. So what I did it was I installed 
uh, Arch in uh, on DistroBox. I installed Vivaldi inside of Arch, just you know, pseudo Pac-Man dash you know S Vivaldi. Maybe I installed it from the the AUR. I don't even remember. And then DistroBox export dash dash app Vivaldi, and now I'm using Vivaldi running on Arch on OpenSUSE. And I'm never updating it ever, <laughs> so it just doesn't break. Um, but also, so what, what's your, what's, can can I just ask you a question? Man? Sure. This seems like a lot of work, like a lot of work to get the world's shittiest browser okay. that is also the most unethical one installed. First of, which first of all, I will say only makes sense if you're using the tools that come with it. Please tell me you're using them. Like, are you using the email no, browser? No, no, no. Or the... the the best feature of Vivaldi is workspaces. I'm telling you, man. If you are a tab hoarder like I am, I have hundreds of tabs open. Okay, at any given time, I can organize them in workspaces, which is basically a tab groups, and then I can have groups inside of the groups. I'm telling you right now, it's so much better than any other hey, browser. Matt? What? Matt, can I blow your mind? What? You can keybind bookmark folders in Firefox. That when you hit the keybind, it automatically opens all the all the uh, th- things in that bookmark. Doesn't folder. work the way with my workflow works. I want my my tabs open all the time. See now, now I under everything makes sense now. His it's browser about has tabs. workspaces. That's, that's <laughs> all it is. It's workspaces, man. Of course, I had to use it. It's it's really good. workspaces tabs. This is why he used i three. He probably had like multiple i three windows open with multiple tabs in each window I too. Ha- so. Qtile has tabs, and I use them extensively. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're good. I can't help it. Like I, I, I have 17 workspaces on Qtile. I use them. I have some of my workspaces have five or six tabs of things open. It's it's good. I can't help it. It's my workflow. Matt, it's good. Uh- on the day where I actually drive up to Michigan to like buy you the steak that I said I was going to buy you, uh, I'm just going to just reboot your computer one day just to watch you cry. Oh my god! Okay, <laughs> wouldn't hurt me. Okay, it really wouldn't hurt me because I have it set up so all I have to do is press key binding. All my applications just open right up where they're supposed to. Uh, plus, oh, okay. Pl- plus, I I reboot like every four days. He packs up his tabs, guys. No, no, no. It remembers <laughs> tabs. This is not the like the the eighties. Okay, <laughs> it works fine. Um, Why am I the only one who who uh, who understands Matt and I'm with Matt a hundred percent? I understand it. I'm not with him. <laughs> I'm glad he's got someone on his side. <laughs> I like workspaces. I can't help it. It's 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 good. Um, I like organizing. Well, not things. only workspaces, not only workspaces. Vivaldi has a wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even I, can't, I can't say it. <laughs> a wonderful I, email client. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'm I'm glad you brought that one up because if you were about to say file manager, because I can't remember if they added that. I know that was in the oh. talks for a while. <laughs> I was about to freak. <laughs> You'd be like, really, man? In your browser, a file I manager? Mean, Come on. No, 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 no. Wait, Chromium wait, wait. ships a file manager in Chrome. I know, I know, yeah. but still, you get my voice. No, no, but but it has also a wonderful RSS feed, so you don't have to run. Three different applications on your uh, on your system just to get all these three things. You can have them in a single app: RSS feed, email client, uh, and the sidebar. And not to mention the sidebar where I, I browse my Fostodon from time to time for quick access, and uh, and the uh, and the workspaces. Vivaldi Actually, has a lot of features. Where you bring with up other a good v- point. With Vivaldi having all of these like the, all of these features, and including the fact that Matt, this is a big one. It's got workspaces. Theoretically speaking, if you're able to get all of the features that you use in other programs included into Vivaldi, if assuming they're not already there, you could just use Vivaldi and like use um, oh, what's I don't know it where called? that's going. Uh, the video, um, the frame buffer, and just just load up Vivaldi in a frame buffer. No window manager, no nothing. And just use that. You could. Do <laughs> I knew. That. I knew you were going to head uh, head there. Well, I knew you were going to head Vival- there. Vivaldi is a little weird because they they actually have an environment variable that hard checks for for an environment session, so you actually can't run it headlessly on Xorg. That said, on Wayland you can using Cage. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Alexi has the exact point I was just about to make. Vivaldi is the Emacs of web browsers. Yeah. Yes. 
I mean, theoretically 100%. speaking, I would not be surprised at all if Vivaldi is currently working on integrating OBS features into it. Like, that would not surprise me in the slightest. Vivaldi would be I think, perfect. And, I, and I, guys got to remember, I, don't, I think it does have an FFmpeg dependency. It does. Yes, it, <laughs> it does. But that, that's basically for wide vine and, and, and DRM stuff. Yeah. Um, no, there is there is a separate package called uh, Vivaldi wide vine. It's only a UR. Yeah. Um, Vivaldi would be perfect. And guys got to remember, I don't use the email client or the RSS stuff. I don't, I don't need that stuff in a browser. Uh, it it would be perfect if it was all open source, or if they would just call oh, it yeah. proprietary and stop stop with this whole ninety. Oh, but we're ninety five percent open source. If you're ninety five percent open source, then you're not open source. That's not the way that it works. Either you, it's all or nothing. Um, Android is ninety five percent open source. <laughs> yeah, mm. probably not that percentage. I, I'm curious though, Matt. I, I'm curious. Have you gotten the Have you gotten the e the uh, email about the uh, Opera GX sponsorship yet? No. I, okay, I, I I'm just waiting. I'm waiting to see that that response that you would give that person. Uh, the most of the sponsorship stuff that I get is crypto nonsense, and that stuff goes directly to spam. All right. So and yes, I know, I know, I use proprietary software. Fucking forgive me. Um, All everyone uses proprietary software. If you're using NVIDIA driver, guess what? You're using proprietary. If you're software. using the regular so Linux kernel, you have proprietary stuff on your on your system. Sorry, but that's the way it works. All right, anyways, guys, seriously, it is after 5 o'clock. We totally, like, I wanted to be done in an hour. We did not do that at all, even close. It, it's fine. Ooh. Guys, just to let you know, next week is a rant cast. Yes, um, and, and I think I have a good topic for it. Uh, we'll see. We'll see <laughs> if I can remember what the, <laughs> you uh, say, You send us the topic. You send us the topic. If we like, we'll do the research. If we don't like, we'll let you talk. No, you'll talk about my topic whether you like it or not, bitch. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, I will, in fact, talk about your topic because I guarantee you that there's going to be something about it where I disagree with I'm you in it. I'm sure that's 100% I don't even know true. what the topic is. I'm just calling it now. <laughs> okay, guys. But, so uh, next week, I'll, uh, I'll just be here for the comic relief, and I will be staring at the screen most of the time. We'll choose a topic that Steve has a lot of, uh, of things to say about. Anyways, that's it for this episode. We do record this live every Saturday around 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time at YouTube.com slash TheLinuxCast. Thanks to all my patrons. I should... Patrons? Patrons? I should... I should say that before you guys oh. go th- patreon.com slash linux why is it that every time patreon.com yeah no no no, no, no hold on a second linux cast every time the podcast ends my words fail that's because i'm rushing because i really need to stop this podcast at the at the earliest possible moment anyways patreon.com slash linux cast thanks to everybody who does support me on patreon youtube you guys are all awesome thank you so very much i do know that people are looking for the vods after the podcast ends those are patreon exclusives now uh, if you want to watch the podcast, you'll have to just watch the edited version or go to Patreon and, and give me support there. Uh, I'm doing it because I want to edit the show, and in order to do that, I need to pull it down. Uh, but there are ways of finding the VOD if you want to find it. I'm just not telling you how to do that. So anyways, thanks for everybody for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Patreon. <laughs>